Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Cosmopolicast. I'm Mo, your host. And for those of you who are new to the Cosmopolicast, have a listen to our first episode when we talked about the media. And if you're not, thanks. Thanks for listening again and contributing in the comments section. I'd like to personally say hi to Paul, who wrote in citing Count Kiji. And here I'm going to quote Paul. He said, declared, who Count Kiji declared, there was no reason ever to leave the city. And most Senesi have followed his example ever since. It's true, Paul. It has to do with the walls. That's my own personal view. Siena's surrounded by them. It's a medieval fortress city. So I look at those walls and I think they're walls also, they're mental barriers. And in the past, I think they were very handy in keeping those pesky Florentines out, at least until 1558. But those walls have not been effective for what's been going on today. The pandemic knows no walls. So let's jump in to today's chat, which is all about the pandemic and how we can resolve it. Let me bring in my fellow cosmopolitan globalists who hail from all over. Hello, Rachel. Hello. And Robert. Hello. Owen, how are you doing? Good morning. Yourself? Good. <laughs> great, great. John, how you doing? Very good. And Thank Claire, you. Claire. How are you guys doing well? Are we all livid with rage? <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. Okay, we've decided to divide, to sort of organize this podcast into three parts. In the first part, we'll be getting into how we got into this mess, maybe provide a bit of context, and some of the errors that have been made, continue to be made, unfortunately. Then in part two, we'll be hearing about why it's so important to bring this pandemic to an end and how that can be done. And then in the third part, I think what's really, really important to get at as well is how do we deal with vaccine hesitancy? So let's jump into part one, everybody. And I'd like to start off our discussion with John's article. It's on the narcissism of small differences. I was very struck by this article. Let me read just a bit of it, just to refresh everybody's memory. Let me just start off with this. In 1917, Sigmund Freud described the narcissism decline the difference and the narcissism of small differences. Communities with adjoining territories with and close relationships, he summarized, were especially likely to engage in feuds and mutual ridicule, not because they were so different, but because they were so similar. They were hyper-attuned to the small details that distinguished them. Of two neighboring towns, he later wrote, in civilization and its discontents, each is the other's jealous rival. Every little canton looks down upon the others with contempt. And here is John. The narcissism of Europe and America's small differences has kept both focused on the policy failures of the other and distracted them both from the far more important point. The West, Europe, and America together failed. John, Robert, you both written articles about this. My question is this, okay, and Rachel and Claire, feel free, okay, to jump in at any time if you've got a question as well. So John and Robert, why has the West been unable to get a handle on the pandemic. Is this a failure of leadership? John, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Robert as well. I saw a definite failure in leadership. For the most part, politicians seem to want to follow the what they perceived as the will of the people, and were generally not willing to make unpopular decisions. And that was particularly, obviously, clear in the United States, but it was to a large extent also true in Europe as well. Okay. We saw that. Uh, can you give us a little more from the article, John? what was happening in Austria at the time. And it's, of course, it's, it's changed a little now. The problem in Austria, at first was everything just went so well that everyone patted themselves on the back. This is also true in the neighboring countries, particularly in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, to some extent Poland as well, that they felt that they had to lock down, they did their job, and then everything seemed to be fine. And they saw the 
mayhem that was happening in the United States over the summer and the chaos and the lack of coordination and decided that they were just doing a much better job than the Americans and much smarter and had a better approach. And then they just let drop the ball entirely. So by the time we got to November, we think we, you know, it's been talked to death, but obviously they completely failed to provide enough vaccines or take vaccination seriously. It's interesting to talk to Robert about testing. Austria actually invested quite a lot in testing and it turned out to be a massive failure for a number of reasons probably because the government did it more for show and most of the people, population was never convinced there was a valid reason to go get tested. Well, that's where Robert's ideas come in. Robert, why don't you explain what you explained in your article? So look, it's been known for a very long time that if you want to shut down a pandemic, regardless of whether you have a vaccine or not, you can do it by isolating the carriers. This is ABC. So what I suggested was that we test the bulk of the population every week. Now, the authorities cannot do that. They do not have the staff, but employers could do it easily. In fact, I not only wrote articles about this, I managed to secure some fast testing equipment for my own company. I lead a, a small aerospace company. I have 20 employees. Actually, it'd be illegal for me to have my own testing program, so we managed to uh, legalize it by making a research a research project for this testing thing to see how well such a thing would work. So every Monday morning, we fast test my entire workforce. And in fact, a month ago, we identified someone who was COVID positive. We sent him to an official testing site for confirmation so we wouldn't be dealing with a false positive. They confirmed it was a real positive. So we sent him home he actually became symptomatic and quite ill, but then he recovered and after he tested negative, he came back to the workplace. That's all you need to do. Now, I managed to protect my employees. I managed to protect my company from being shut down with a massive workplace infection. But you see, this is a strategy that can be implemented on a national basis. If instead of uh, discouraging and actually preventing employers from doing fast testing, national leaders were to say, we wish every employer to test all their employees once a week and then send us them to us for official testing if you get a, a positive. We would just shut the whole pandemic down. If we could sweep through, say, half the population, which is to say the employee part, which is the part that's in circulation, once a week, you're going to send our naught below one and you'll crash the pandemic. And this was so obvious. And I actually wrote several articles about this in the National Review. And one of them was read by Newt Gingrich, who is a conservative politician, who I happen to know because he's interested in space exploration. And he took this matter to Mike Pence. And he was told to shut up and be a team player because the position of the Trump administration at that time was, look, this whole pandemic thing is just a conspiracy by Democrats to make me look bad and ruin my economy so they can get elected. And I also sent it to my congressman, who I know, who is a Democrat, and he took it to Pelosi and to the governor of our state, uh, Jared Polis, and neither of them acted on it, even uh, to voice saying, well, this is what you should do, because their main strategy was, let's watch Trump fail. So I think the real failure here is a failure of public spirit on the part of the political class that they viewed the pandemic as a partisan thing to be dealt with in the context of the election and not to be dealt with as a serious public health problem that they needed to act on. Wow. And I think this is still the case. I have problems with Trump and I have problems, frankly, with every governor, Democrat or Republican, because not one of them have acted intelligently on this issue. I just want to confirm that when I heard about this from Robert, I tried to get the FDA's side of the story. It was impossible. I sent at least 30 emails to their press office. No one returned my emails. See, I understand they're obviously very busy right now. That's understandable, but not even a cursory, not even a pro forma email with someone who's trying to figure out what they're thinking. That strikes me as not defensible democratically. But see, I don't think the European failure, it's not, a, it's not a partisan issue as much in Europe. It's more a bureaucratic failure. Yes. Across the board. You know, I don't yes, think but you have to ask why the bureaucracies believe the public won't hang them from the lampposts. Why are the bureaucracies content with the idea that they should screw up so much? Well, at this point, they seem to be right. As I think you've seen in France as well, Claire, right? People in Austria are just surprisingly not angry about this. 
This is the question okay. I keep asking. Why aren't people furious? Well, some question. people here are. Uh, in particular, we have total chaos in the distribution of the vaccines. This has been a total failure, for example, here in Colorado, where we have a Democrat governor, Polis. There's no statewide system. I was able to get vaccinated because my wife, Hope, joined this group of women who are called pro-vaxxers, and they are constantly searching the net for whenever a place uh, announces that it has some vaccines available. And you have to pounce on these openings. It's like scalping theater tickets. And if you don't register within an hour, those opportunities are going to be gone. I managed to get my first vaccine up in Greeley, which is almost two hours north of Denver, where I live. And uh, Hope got her first vaccine down in Colorado Springs, which is an hour and a half south of here. You, you just have to go all over the place scrambling to find a place that, that had the stuff. There's been no organization of this whatsoever. And let's discuss the fact that both in Europe and the United States, it has been well known that vaccinations would arrive and the logistics for this were going to be required and no one worked them out. Shocking that no one had, no one was working on a plan for this from day one. It is shocking that there are stockpiles full of AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson vaccines that aren't being used. Perhaps, Robert, you'd like to speak about that. Well, sure. And once again, and, and by the way, this is not unique to this situation. In the late 80s, when the AIDS crisis arose, the FDA essentially killed tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of American gays by uh, denying them access to AIDS treatments that were already proven and effective in Europe. You're seeing um, the same thing right now also with uh, Lyme disease, proven treatments that doctors are not permitted to use. Correct. To, to be clear about this, because they, the people who protect this uh, or attempt to justify this behavior by the FDA are always confusing safety testing with effectiveness testing. These are two different issues. Safety testing of a drug can be done very quickly. You give it to a thousand people and if nobody gets sick, well, okay, it looks like it's safe. Whereas effectiveness testing, and especially of a preventative drug. Well, whoa there, Robert. I mean, thalidomide was not safe. Yeah, but look, 10,000 people were victims of thalidomide. I know. Between and Europe that, and the and United Florida. States, over a million people have died of COVID. Yeah, I, I agree. But it's, it's your standards for assessing safety are not... No, 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 no. L let me make this point. This is an essential point. <laughs> it must be made clear. If you have a preventative drug, which is what a vaccine is, right, you can prove that it's safe by dosing 1,000 people, 2,000, if you prefer 10,000, it doesn't matter, and you see no statistical incidence of harm, you can know that it's safe. And in fact, safety testing of the principal vaccines, uh, such as the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, were both completed by August 2020. But you're not However, including me. the access of time. Well, excuse me. I, I would really like to make this point because this is a fundamental point. Effectiveness testing of a preventative drug requires something else entirely. It requires giving the drug to one population and not to a control population and waiting to gather statistics to see if the vaccinated population gets COVID at a lower incidence of than the unvaccinated population. So these are, are two different issues, safety and effectiveness. And the latter takes much more time. And in fact, it was not completed in the case of Moderna and Pfizer until December. And then they authorized them, although they took a month to think about it in each case. So instead of starting the vaccination program in September, it was really not started in any serious way until January. And this was an enormous loss. And I, I just have to say, you know, I have a vitamin D bottle in uh, pills, and it is well known to medicine that vitamin D prevents rickets. And so the bottle on it says, help promotes healthy bones. And it has an asterisk. And on it, it says, the asterisk says, this statement is not approved by the FDA. Vitamin D was proven effective against rickets a century ago, and they are still not willing to admit it. The only reason why you can get vitamin D pills today is because they were already legal before there was an FDA. And then you have the AstraZeneca situation where the FDA says it wants to do an effectiveness test for AstraZeneca 
involving about 30,000 people, and this test is going to run through April, when in the meantime, millions of people have already gotten in the UK and the results are quite clear. So they're just holding up the train in order to have people say, mother may I. The AstraZeneca situation is absurd and murderous, but I want to go back to your point about safety because I don't think you've clarified this point sufficiently. We cannot tell whether a drug is safe simply by dosing 10,000 people and waiting a week. There are long-term effects of drugs. What is the optimal amount of time to wait and how do you balance that? Thalidomide, wasn't, it wasn't a good bet because the only problem was morning sickness. When you have a more serious condition, indeed when you have a pandemic, you have to shorten the time, but how do you adjudicate how long you wait? Well, hey, you can do comparative risk assessment and go through all the math, but the situation here was really clear. Well, what's okay. the, what, what mean, is the math? What is the math? I mean, do you realize that 140,000 people in the United States no, have no, no. died I, of, I am very of, well of aware COVID? of that, Robert. Okay, this is not a morning sickness problem. This is a pandemic. This is a catastrophe. 140,000 Americans have died of COVID since Joe Biden has been inaugurated. That's as many Americans as died in World War I. You know, if you have this thing, which is manifestly killing people by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, and you say, well, why don't we wait 10 years to see if there's after effects of the drug? This is not permissible. This is insanity. You're preaching to the choir, but what do you think is the reasonable amount of time to wait and why? I think the reasonable amount of time to wait is a month. And, I, I, and I'll tell you why. And that is what the safety testing does involve. And I have spoken about this with biologists, that the vast majority of negative effects are going to make themselves apparent within two weeks. Uh, there was actually an article about the precautionary principle in the New York Times today. And they said, let's say a guy is stuck down on the subway track and he wants to use the service ladder to get out of the track before the train runs him over. But somebody comes along and says, we don't know that this service ladder is suitable for uh, civilian use. So we're going to want to subject it to a month of testing. Good luck down there on the track. That is what you have going on here. If yes. you've got a train coming at you, you take the damn service ladder. I think it's, it's a good way to explain it by, by means of that analogy. But I'm looking for something more formal to explain what we're seeing in the bureaucracies, both in the U.S. and the EU. The EU okay, what a directive. Could do probabilistic risk assessment. Or how about this? Free choice, where you inform the public this has been safety tested on the basis of one month of safety. Uh, there are strong indications that's effective based on that testing. And it's available. You can take it if you like. Absolutely. And as we're As going along, we'll, we'll do more testing, but you can take it now. That's correct. It's available for those who want it. Because what you have right now, I mean, look, when a government says that you cannot have a drug, they are using force because government is force. It is, as Lenin said, a body of armed men. And they, at gunpoint, are telling you that you cannot use AstraZeneca vaccine. So this is somebody at the top of that safety ladder, you know, with a stick preventing you from getting on the ladder. That's what it is. So it needs to be a free choice. Let the people make their own risk assessment. Yes, I basically agree with that. Although I think a large amount of compulsion needs to go into getting people vaccinated. Uh, but that's certainly we'll not the problem at this point. No, that, the problem at this point, point in the United supply. States is finding a place that will vaccinate you. At this point, the problem is supply. In about six months, all the same people will be vaccinated, and a large group, a very large group in, in France at least, will refuse to be vaccinated and will keep the pandemic alive forever until France achieves herd immunity the very hard way. If you have half the population vaccinated, that's going to do a lot to cut down our naught right there. I mean, part of the whole anti-vaxxer story has been, you're going to try to make me use that vaccine. Damn if, right I am. Okay, if you make it voluntary, there's a lot less resistance. Yeah, there, there are things you can do in between, which is the brilliance of Napoleon's strategy. I, I've been studying the Napoleonic campaign against smallpox, which I had known absolutely nothing about until I, I, I happened across an article by me searching for French vaccination hesitancy and I came across this article and it's stunning because all of these debates were prominent 17th century debates. Uh, Jenner's cowpox vaccine 
was anteceded by the knowledge that you could just inject someone with a small amount of real smallpox, and one in 200 would die, but the rest would be inoculated. And there was a fantastically interesting debate. One of the proponents of vaccination was the French um, mathematician, the very well-known mathematician, and his name is Bernoulli, who proved mathematically that it would be better to vaccinate everyone. This is the first proof of this. And he said, well, there it is. We figured it out. The light of reason will shine through and everyone will be vaccinated. It's better for everyone. And his critic, Gotti, said, no, that's not the way the human mind works. It doesn't, people can't understand things like this. If they understand that there's any amount of risk involved in a vaccination, they won't do it. That's just not the way people are. And unfortunately, he was right. And Napoleon, this was after, um, well, it was one of the royal family, was killed by smallpox, became a, a fervent advocate of vaccination. The tradition had already been set in France. This was a very personal matter. It was between you and your doctor to decide. He did not impose vaccination by force. He instead created the entire administrative apparatus of, of, of the entire French health system, really, and impressed into service people from every walk of life to go to every community, every village, every church, and get as many people vaccinated as possible. It was an enormous public relations campaign that focused on the clergy and having the clergy convince the idiots, as they said in their own language, to get vaccinated with incredible success. He wiped out smallpox. And among his reasons for, for wanting to do this was that he believed France's strength was in its demography. And indeed, by conquering smallpox, he conquered the world. And I was so struck by the leadership I mean, being struck by Napoleon's leadership is not exactly the original yeah. thing. But, <laughs> but there is a reason people remember him for this. And it is the kind of vision that is so absent in the Western world right now. Well, also, I mean, since you bring up Napoleon, he was waging a war on smallpox. Yes. And he knew how to take the war to the enemy, which means you vaccinate preemptively. Right now, the, the testing program still has not been something like what I'm saying, which is take the war to the enemy. Test everyone once a week and you're going to crush the pandemic. Furthermore, if you test everyone once a week and now you have vaccines and if someone tests positive and they're going to be sent home and lose pay because they didn't get the vaccine and they have ended up positive, well, that creates an incentive for you might call soft reluctance. Yeah. At this point, French policy seems almost designed to make the pandemic go on forever and to cripple the French economy. I mean, the latest lockdown is really designed to cripple what's left of the French economy. It, it can't be designed to do anything else. The, the lockdown rules are incomprehensible from an epidemiological point of view. Stay out as long as you like, but don't shop in the larger stores. They, they keep changing the rules. No one has any idea what they mean. Go out in the daytime. Don't go out at nighttime. If, if you're more than 10 kilometers away from your house, you need to fill out a form. If they instituted a completely strict lockdown, the way they did in Wuhan, in which food was delivered to everyone's door, yes, you'd wipe out the pandemic in three weeks. That's how long it takes until everyone who has it stops spreading it. Three weeks of real lockdown can do it. Partial lockdowns aren't going to do the job. And they, they yeah. just destroy the economy. As you said, Claire, then they make people believe the government isn't acting in good faith. Exactly. exactly. If Austria is fine to go skiing, but uh, otherwise keep social distance, that doesn't make any sense to people. Well, if you can go skiing, obviously this isn't a big deal. And they, are, they don't trust the government anymore. The EU keeps going on and on about how it's, it's, it's doing what's in the world's interest because it's giving away so many of its vaccines without asking itself, is this in the world's interest? Because Europe is now becoming the breeding ground for monster mutants. By the time they manage to vaccinate enough of their citizens, they're going to be swept again by new mutations and Ursula von der Leyen will be found preventing the EU from a timely purchase of a booster. Well, let me just uh, mention a point too, something that we should have at least talked about. Uh, we, we never talked about, uh, about uh, challenge tests, fully vaccinating a group of say a thousand or 10,000 healthy young volunteers, making sure they're fully vaccinated and then challenging them with the actual virus. I mean, maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe we don't want to do that, but we never even talked about it. Um, something, I think that gets at the idea that something that doesn't seem to have dawned on people is that in a pandemic, the rules are different. Right. People still go Actually, by the rule that it can't happen to me. 
and if it hasn't happened to anyone I know, it's not real, and I'm immortal. People are still going by those rules. Right, to take up Claire's point on that. In a pandemic, things are different. You had these um, Pfizer, Moderna vaccines uh, tested in the testing program with a two-dose regimen. And so they said, well, we've certified it for that regimen. But there was also a lot of data available already in the fall that if two doses did 95% protection with Pfizer, one dose would be about 75% protection. And so it was an obvious thing. It was pointed out in the Wall Street Journal, it was pointed out by Tony Blair more effectively, that, well, if one dose to an unvaccinated person is worth 75% of a protection, the second one is only worth 20. And if you want to crush the pandemic, you want to give as many people the first dose as quickly as possible. It's more than three times as valuable as the second dose. Now, this was very clear. And fortunately, in the UK, they embraced this. But in the US, you know, Fauci's, well, we've tested it. It's a two-dose regimen, and that's how it should be. And you see, that's looking at the disease as if you have a patient, what's the right way to cure that patient? As opposed to you have a pandemic, what's the right way to shut down exactly. a pandemic? Exactly. Um, it, it, they are looking at this disease as if it was something that had a stable occurrence, a stable percentage of the population had it, instead of seeing it as something that grows exponentially, mutates, and destroys countries, takes down their economies, irrespective of whether there's a formal lockdown, because people, people will get the idea pretty quickly of what happens if they go out in the middle of a pandemic. The reason that death rates have been comparatively low is because of all the social distancing and quarantining and masking. Well, also lockdowns are not sustainable. You can't have a country with everybody locked down. It's simply not a useful policy. Whereas if you do mass testing and you only lock down people identified as carriers, now you're locking down a tenth of a percent of the population a real lockdown works, but it has to be brutal. And then it can be three weeks long and you're back to normal. Well, that simply was not a, a possibility in the West. It wasn't a possibility in the West. And it's interesting to ask why, because it's the best policy. Although New Zealand came close, like they, they, they've been able yeah. to really keep a handle on it compared to other Western countries anyway. Well, you can't really compare Australia and New Zealand to the rest of the world. You know, in 1918, the flu didn't even appear in Australia until the third wave in December. The relative isolation helps them a great deal. Look, you don't need to lock everyone down. You just need to lock the carriers down. And if you test everyone, you know who the carriers are and you lock them down. And that's all there is to this. Sure, if you lock everyone down, that will work too, but you can't do that for very long. Mm -hmm. But isn't it in Europe the problem is a site maybe psychological and cultural. First, we have these privacy laws, which I think would make it very difficult for employers to test because the government doesn't want to allow employers to have these this data and health data on employees. Right. And then you have the issue that Europe doesn't like to single out anybody. But they're very allergic to singling out any groups or individuals. So now we can't have that sort of, we have to lock down everybody or nothing gets locked down. Yes. So because of bureaucratic inertia, we haven't done the most logical thing we could have done. Right. And also competing bureaucratic impulses so that every policy is done in a half-assed, incompetent way, making things worse rather than better. Right. But then worse, like you said, Claire, there's no negative feedback. The politicians pay no consequences yeah. for these mistakes, yeah. which makes it even worse. That's the ultimate question that vexes me. I don't, don't understand why the citizens of the world's best known democracies that are supposed to be enjoying the benefits of democracy aren't expecting more from their governments, aren't demanding more. Well, I frankly believe that Trump lost the election because he didn't do enough. You know, the Republicans actually gained in Congress, but Trump lost. And I think ultimately this was the issue that said to people, look, we, we've got to have something better than this. Wouldn't you expect to see protests? Wouldn't you expect to see people immolating themselves in front of the White House, in front of the EU Parliament? This is such a serious screw up. I think that one of the reasons that Europeans aren't more furious about the lack of vaccines is vaccine hesitancy. But I'd like to find a more denigrating word. I've been struggling with what's going on here. Why would people 
in a society so advanced that we understand completely the workings of a eukaryotic cell. We know all the different parts of it, the, the ribosomes, the, the messenger RNA. How can a society with this much scientific knowledge in some sense have so many people who remain mired in magical belief that was already outdated by Stuart and Tudor England? And I think it is a powerful counter-enlightenment longing. People do not want the enlightenment anymore. They want to go back to something much simpler. Well, here's a word for you. How about technophobia? Technophobia. I, I don't think it quite captures it. I think there's... Well, well, it's the same thing that makes genetically modified food unsellable in Europe. The people who are most prominent and loud on the internet, their anti-vax theories, not, they don't rise to the level of theories, are using the internet. Yeah, but... You know, whether you're talking about nuclear power, genetically modified food, or vaccinations, it's a form of, of, of technophobia. Yeah, sure, I don't know anyone who is afraid to use the telephone, they're, but there are people who have been mobilized by irrational fears of these sorts of, of innovations, and it, it's really consistent. And, I mean, frankly, Europe is amazing in this respect, as, as you say, because you know, here after Fukushima, Germany shuts down all its nuclear power plants as if, you know, tidal waves are going to reach Munich or something. Totally crazy. And the but it's French... paradoxical because the, the level of scientific culture is also so high. We've never been at a point where so much of humanity has had access to so much scientific knowledge. I, mean... I don't think the majority of people actually are familiar with it, though. There's perhaps a general sense that we generally as a society know these things but most individuals don't. Yeah, I agree. Um, One thing I do want to say about this is that a lot of what we call disinformation, all of the medical disinformation that's out there, a lot of it is presented by pseudo doctors. I mean, I took a look at everything that's posted on a lot of these sites. I've been doing research on this for over a year from February, 2020. I think it's personally a question of trust. I mean, a vaccine is supposed to protect. As soon as you get information out there that says, okay, you know, the vaccine is not going to protect you or will only protect you 70% or something like that. I mean, that's what people look at. I'm not saying it's right. Believe me, I got the jab and I was extremely happy about getting it. But I mean, we even have medical staff who won't take it. You know, this is this is a problem. This You're is a real problem. Not so much. I have to say in Italy, not so much. But I know that in France, right, Claire and in Germany, okay, they're having problems with this kind of thing. So, I mean, we have to remember that this comes after years and years and years of gr like growing t distrust. Well, I think it's also a growing distrust of and breakdown of uh, institutions. I mean... Name an institution you trust. There are a few for us, probably, but the, go out in the street and ask the first guy you meet in the crosswalk to name an institution he trusts. Not a lot. And some of that is reasonable. A lot of our institutions have become platforms rather than institutions. And people rightly distrust a number of them. And deformed institutions push out deformed people. Yes, I think that's right. And I think the enterprise of science and the Enlightenment need to take some responsibility for their own mistakes that have, that have led to a severe yes. breach of trust. Yes. yes. What, what do you mean but, by that, Claire? What mistakes has science made? What about the 1,200 epidemiologists who signed on to a letter saying that the pandemic of racism was more important than the pandemic of COVID-19? Okay, well, that's not science. That's 1,200 individuals who are going along with a woke craze. Sure, but there is a reason that if you're too stupid to read the literature and you're looking for an authority to trust, you're going to say those authorities don't know what they're talking about. People who mm -hmm. should not be besmirching their reputation and the incredibly important responsibilities they have are doing it. Well, I, I think there's a deeper problem here. Uh, you touched on it, but I want to come back to it. Uh, which is why I use the word technophobia. See, I think that for all their flaws and the fact that there are people in Kansas who don't believe in evolution, Americans remain more optimistic about technological progress and what it means. And 
the, the basically the belief in the scientific project, the, pro, the project of progress. Okay, Americans believe in progress. And in fact, you know, I, I think that when other people satirize Americans, Americans always think that it, it's happily ever after, right? They believe that change is, is probably a, a good thing as opposed to a bad thing, that we can always make things better. And I think that these counter-enlightenment sediments are much more prevalent in Europe. You know, I mean, the space program has much more support in America than it does in Europe. You know, Europe has a, a larger population and economy than the United States. Their space program is one-fifth the size. You know, I, I think, frankly, if they want to cure this, maybe they should launch a, a major STEM effort. And, and what that means, like a space program, is just raise the spirit that science opens an endless frontier of a future greater possibility. You're speaking about Europe as an undifferentiated entity here, and that's just not fair. France France reveres science. I mean, the, if you walked through the Jardin des Plantes and you looked at the exhibits, you would say, why don't we have anything like this in America, where children are taught to look at bones in the Paleontology Museum and they, all this flora and fauna are labeled and the diagram of the Tree of Life is laid out and everything is is, is an exhibit, a tribute to this incredible tradition of French science. And this, that's the other thing that I just can't get my head around. France is the home of so many great scientists, mathematicians, physicists, biologists, doctors, and yet there's this underlying, and it's not the dominant strain. Most people want to get vaccinated, but there's a recalcitrant, say 20 or 30 percent, who are, is enough to do a great deal of damage. And by the way, the U.S. is second only to France in the number of anti-vax, uh, the number of people who don't like vaccinations. The rest of the world loves them. How do you explain that? I mean, everyone in Egypt wants a vaccination, that's for sure. And I submit, Claire, maybe we're overthinking this because I think that a lot of people in Europe, to be cynical, actually are perfectly fine with the status quo as it is right now. I think everyone, a lot of people view this as a long vacation to an extent. There's no stress. People have apartments, get to sit at home. You still yeah. get to see a few friends if you're social. If you're an introvert, you're not really bothered by any of this. It's true. The governments have cushioned people to a large extent, which is, which is it's not true in Egypt, right? For example. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Maybe that. Maybe that's. It's, it's as simple as that. But the money's going to run out. Yeah, eventually it will. And how how are we going to get out of this? What's the plan, guys? Owen, do you want to talk a bit about what you've written? Well, uh, I guess the first uh, first of that uh, bit of the series was on the actual vaccines, and as we've you know all talked about before, you know it, it's been virtually miraculous how quickly we've had so many vaccines, so many effective vaccines of that, you know, within a year, and e even the you know e even the Russian one, the Chinese ones, the very worst certainly look look a lot better than nothing. You know, they're certainly as effective as the annual flu shot that we get, you know, most years, right? We have a good number of candidates to, uh, to actually use now. So, that, so that's good. In, in terms of manufacturing, we, we ran the numbers and we kind of added up, you know, for all the different approved vaccines, plus the Johnson Johnson, which was just approved, and the uh, Novavax, which will probably be approved next month or maybe May. There's enough to vaccinate 6.8 billion people. However, that's if everything goes well, goes off without a hitch, <laughs> you know, and, and that happens all the time when you're talking about, you know, global, <laughs> global <laughs> efforts to do anything, right? So, so I, I, I think, and we made the point in, in the article as well, we, we don't have enough capacity yet. It's not if we want to want to kill this thing as quickly as we possibly can, not if we want to do it this year. So we, we still do need to, to increase capacity. Robert's talked about that before uh, in terms of making some of the patents, well, removing the patents, making them open source on, on some of them. I don't know if you want to mention that a little bit, Robert. Well, the Moderna uh, patent is public domain because we uh, government actually funded the research. The Pfizer isn't, but if it was necessary, the government could simply offer Pfizer a great deal. Here's $10 billion, give us the rights, and you can still sell it, but it will now be non-exclusive. And we're going to license it to a lot of other companies. In fact, I, I believe Pfizer itself worked out a licensing deal with uh, Merck. Yeah, to, Biden was very proud of that. Yes. Well, the government should have been pushing that and, in fact, pushing it very aggressively with the Moderna vaccine, which they actually own the rights to. But I, I think there's a larger issue here. Look, I, I think anybody who has a medical education 
and is not part of the bureaucracy is aware of how mishandled this is and how atrocious it is. For example, the AstraZeneca vaccine, several hundred million doses are sitting in warehouses in Ohio and not being distributed and because the FDA wants to approve it itself instead of it relying on the British approval. And you see, the issue here is that while science is international, bureaucracies are national and it, they protect themselves and they also protect industries in their own countries against foreign competition. Why aren't there petitions? Why isn't there a New York Times op-ed signed by every member of the scientific community? Why isn't there a united front pressure saying, let the AstraZeneca vaccines out? I, I can't say. There certainly has been on the testing front, there was a very large number of epidemiologists saying, look, you got to open up mass rapid testing. Yeah, there were, and to no avail. If the point of democracy is accountability, and the public doesn't really care whether this thing goes away, because they somehow believe that, I don't know what, they, what they're thinking. I mean, Americans now, almost every one of them has knows someone who's died of it, right? I think the problem is there's no organized voice here. In other words, the Democrats, while carping about how bad Trump was about masks, never offered a coherent policy on how to wage war against COVID. Biden's done a little better, but frankly, he's mostly used the epidemic as a cover for getting appropri massive appropriations for a bunch of Democratic welfare state mm -hmm. priorities. Mm -hmm. You know, if the Republicans were smart, they would be the loyal opposition in saying, why aren't you let the American people have access to yeah. those vaccines. But Robert, we demand point, the right the to protect Republicans ourselves. Are not smart. No, they're not. And <laughs> they, instead, they're sticking with this other shit, okay, and other stuff. You know, here you have a party which is very committed to the right of self defense. I can have a semi automatic weapon thanks to the Republican Party, but I can't have an AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah, exactly. The politicians are responding to public demand, the bureaucracies are responding to public demand in some sense. And it leads me to wonder what exactly has gone wrong in Europe and the United States, that the public is so selfish, indolent, and unreasonable that they wouldn't be putting the appropriate pressure on the governments that are elected to serve them to serve them. It's not true in Asian democracies. Right, Taiwanese are looking at the anti-mask movement, and I saw, maybe this isn't exactly a statistical survey, but I saw a Taiwanese woman on Twitter say, it's not that the government is forcing us to wear masks, it's that we would lynch them if they didn't protect us from this disease. Why don't we have the same feeling about our democracies? I still think a lot of it goes back to societal approach to disease. Talk to anyone in the chronic illness yeah. communities online, they'll tell you this was the way it was going to work. The sick do not matter. It can't happen to me. It's not real. This, I mean, this is very normal. This is very, very predictable if you talk to anyone from, from that perspective. Have you read Susan Sontag's book, Illness as Metaphor? No, no, I haven't. Really interesting. I, I won't get into it, but I'll, I'll just leave that out there as a, as a suggestion. The human mind does not seem well equipped to deal with mortality and disease. Yes. I, I can't tell you how many people have said it's only people with comorbidities, and I can tell from their profile picture that they're 50 pounds overweight. And when they say things like that online, you're like, wait, do you know how many people who have comorbidities just read you say that? <laughs> they don't understand that obesity is clinically yeah. a, comor a significant comorbidity. 42% of the American population is obese. Including children. Yeah. Overweight is also is not, not as serious as obesity, but it is a comorbidity. And now we're talking 70% of the American population. Yeah. And being over 50 is a, is, is a, puts you at a serious risk. And that's, what, 35% of the American population? But I'm immortal. It can't happen to me. There is some sort of simultaneously a denial of death and a death drive at work. Yes. We also connect health yeah. to morality in the West. If you're sick, like in Asia, your duty when you're sick, you wear a mask traditionally in Japan or Korea because you don't want other people to get sick and it's your duty to prevent other people from getting sick. Whereas in the West, your duty is to go to work no matter how bad you feel. Well, it used Co-workers, it's yeah. their problem. That's changed at least. <laughs> yeah, let's hope I hope changes. so. We'll see. <laughs> I'm not but optimistic. A tough person just fights through it, right? It's only a weak person who has to go lie down and doesn't <laughs> make it to work. It's been a source of 
fury to me. I mean, you could you could rightly ask, what is it a source of fury to you, Claire? <laughs> <laughs> I think to uh, to to pull it back to a really big picture, just talking about the the uh, distribution for for all the problems that that we're currently seeing, you know, deployment in in Europe in particular. And I, I live in Canada. We're doing worse than Europe. Like we're still under 10%. We're doing terribly. <laughs> so, you know, our government has just been incredibly incompetent with the entire thing. But that, that's well, not Hold on, story, Owen. So. Hold on. Well, how are you getting <laughs> your vaccines? I mean, if, <laughs> if the UK and the States are not going to be, they're, they're, they're keeping their vaccines at home. Canada, how is it going to get its vaccines? I mean, this yeah. is also one of the problems that I wanted to ask about also in Europe. But funnily enough, uh, America has just decided to give us uh, 1.5 million of the AstraZeneca ones, and they're giving 2.5 million to Mexico. So that'll be arriving at some point, and we'll pay them back in doses at some like point. Keeping later all, this your, year. all of your um, migrants out of America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> but yeah, Canada actually reserved more than three times the amount that we actually need. Per capita, I think we were the highest in the world, or just about. Canadians don't actually know what our government uh, negotiated with these companies in terms of getting them. But they haven't released the contracts. You know, it's been asked. We have no idea. So clearly, we're not near the top of the uh, priority list. But but I think that you know, even in Canada and in Europe and in the states, probably by sometime this summer, as manufacturing continues to ramp up, most in most Western countries, it will become a problem of demand instead of supply, even in, even here in Canada, it's like we're, we're going to see a sharp uptick in the amount of vaccines that are available at some point. So then the question is, what about the rest of the world, right? So that's that's the big question. Western countries will figure it out, you know, we'll stumble through probably by sometime this summer or the fall at the very latest. But then what about everyone else? You know, the world still hasn't. Yeah, solved. let's talk about the diplomatic side of this, because that's really important. John, you want to you take that up? Yeah, I mean, some countries obviously have done better, and Russia has actually done very well on the diplomatic side of this so far. Brilliantly. You see how effective it is. It's a huge boost to Russian soft power. They've been able to have this vaccine. It's effective, and they've offered it to other countries, even, it sounds like, to the expense of their own citizens, because they don't actually have enough to cover Russian production. They're still giving it away to places like Serbia, Brazil, and Mexico. And China, of course, has done very well. Yeah. So is India. And um, India is... I mean, it's not surprising that India has done well because India is a vaccine powerhouse. They just haven't been as loud about it, but they have supplied an enormous amount of vaccines to the world. The Caribbean, for example, Barbados has done surprisingly well in vaccinating its citizens. 25% of its citizens are vaccinated. It's very strange, the patterns of which countries have, have done well and which haven't. Israel has done brilliantly. Barbados has done brilliantly. You know, I don't have the, the statistics at my fingertips, but India has done what I would have predicted, which is produce a lot of vaccines and distribute them widely. And that's what it's always been doing. It, it supplied 80 percent of the I don't know if that statistic is right, but it's, it's a very high statistic, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the world's glo vaccines globally before. But this is an opportunity for the Biden administration, if it really wants to say America is back, to do something that only Americans could do undertake the project of vaccinating the world, eradicating a pandemic, that would be a feat of magnanimity, power, logistical competence, and competence, pure competence, that once upon a time we would have expected from Americans, and now the world no longer expects it at all. But doing something like that would say in much clearer terms than any, any words whatsoever that we could say, that America is back. Yes, like the polio vaccination campaign. Exactly. And, and Owen, in your calculations, is it actually possible to do this? Well, in terms of, you know, if, if everything does go off without a hitch, getting 6.8 billion people vaccinated this year, uh, that, that, that may be enough for herd immunity. Uh, we're, we're not sure yet. I mean, obviously, you want to aim for 100%. Um, and since no vaccine is 100% effective, even if you vaccinate 6.8 billion people, it doesn't mean that 6.8 billion people are 100% protected, right? So obviously the better, the more effective vaccine you can use if you're able, the better off you'll be, which, which means the two mRNA vaccines, which means the uh, Novavax when it's approved, which apparently, um, you know, if you uh, trust the, the Lancet, the Russian one too, it's uh, got pretty high efficacy using as many of those we can, but with, with current manufacturing capacity, we won't get the entire world vaccinated this year, no. 
what would need to happen specifically? What should Biden be doing today to make this happen? Well, I think, uh, as Robert mentioned before, um, uh, making some of the vaccines open source, well, doing it months ago would have helped. Uh, actually, uh, working on getting manufacturing capacity ramped up. I know uh, uh, Bill Gates, for example, who, who does not get nearly enough credit he's done. So he put billions of dollars into helping uh, various places ramp up their manufacturing capacity. This is before uh, there was really any serious inkling of, uh, of what vaccines would actually be approved. So he, he's kind of doing all he can there. And he's been a big supporter of the uh, COVAX effort. What about appointing Bill Gates the global pandemic czar? <laughs> that, that'd be an excellent yeah, idea. Yeah. I, wish, I wish somebody would do that. <laughs> Why doesn't Biden do that? I mean, if Bill Gates knows how to do this, he is globally credible. He has a proven record. I mean, I suppose he could turn down the job, but why would he? It's his, it's his yeah. raison d'etre. I then- think what's needed is to lead by example. And this is a two-pronged approach. One is mobilize employers for weekly testing. That in itself will shut down the pandemic to a much lower degree. Second, immediately stop putting obstacles in the way of the existing vaccines. And in particular, the AstraZeneca vaccine is very important because it is one fifth the cost of the other vaccines. It's only about, I think, $5 a dose. So you could pay for vaccines for the entire world for $35 billion, which is a few percent one point less than 2% billion. of the cost of the recent COVID emergency appropriation. Okay, right. we could pay for all of this. And if we institute this here rapidly, then others will copy us, Canada, for example, and so forth. And others will say, we want to do this. Can you give us the vaccines? And we'll say, yes. But also, you see, if we do not do this, as uh, Claire pointed out earlier, if you don't put this fire out, it's going to find new forms. We have to damp this thing down before it mutates new forms. Never. Now, the, the, the mass testing will work against any form. In other words, even if it flanks a vaccine, the mass testing will suppress it from becoming a pandemic. Yeah, vaccinate. And then if you have the fire damped down by the mass testing, and then you can vaccinate. And then you say, oh, gee, we have to vaccinate again because there's a new form here. Like every year we have to vaccinate against flu. You know, there it is. But that's what needs to be done. Never has the slogan, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, seemed more appropriate than during the pandemic. Sure. I mean, early in the pandemic, there was this fixation on ventilators, which cost, you know, I don't know how much each, $50,000 or something. And if someone was at the point where they needed a ventilator, there's only 25% chance it would save them. Whereas at the cost of one ventilator, you could have produced tens of thousands of masks. And at this point, tens of thousands I think of vaccines. That was an honest mistake. We really didn't know that ventilation wasn't going to work. Well, um, it's an honest mistake, but it was a misallocation of priorities because it was very clear that the real issue here was prevention, not emergency care of people in extremists. Yeah. Right. So it still seems like in Austria, like most of the policy decisions still seem to be driven by the ICU. The ICUs aren't at overcapacity. The government just doesn't. When the, when the ICUs fill up to 96%, we go into lockdown. And then yep. as soon as the ICUs are down, back down to 70%, we come out of the lockdown. What right. way to manage Pandemic. anything is this? Yeah. No, it isn't. They're not happy about it. In the, I mean, the ICU staff are not happy about staff. No, really. it's burning them out. It's crazy. And they can't get vaccinated now because the AstraZeneca has been banned to anyone under the age of 55. And before that, it was right. banned if you were over 55. Exactly. I mean, that's right. how insane it is. <laughs> and that doesn't create trust with people. Like, well, exactly. Common exactly. people yeah. in the street, like, well, what does that mean? Medical professionals who had appointments to get their AstraZeneca vaccine, which they were next in line to get, have had them canceled because they're under 55. And they're in day-to-day contact with COVID patients. And, and again, I come back to the question, why? This is a country that riots at the drop of a hat. They dump tons of manure in front of the Senate. They, they file an anarchist bunch of rioters here. We all know this. Why aren't they rioting about this? Well, maybe I think it's what John said before. We're very comfortable. Too many people are. The stock market's going up. Property values are rising. Are they? They They're are in Austria. Plunging really? in France. Oh, yeah. 
how are people doing so well? They don't spend any money because they don't go out and they get government subsidies or they need if they don't get eat. The market's being driven up here by the fact that the government's printing money. Right. Well, that's how it's supposed to work. I mean, that's, that's the Keynesian theory. But I don't, I don't understand why there should be a difference in the way property values are responding between Austria and France. I mean, in France, I could purchase a chateau. I, I'm planning to do that with the cosmopolitan globalist. Okay. Yeah, everyone is investing. My friends who are architects tell me they've never been as busy, at least in the fall, they've never been as busy in their lives as they were last fall. Subscribe now and buy Claire a chateau. <laughs> it's our new slogan, Claire. Yeah, property values are going up in Houston also. I, I haven't looked into why. Well, I, I don't have enough of a good theory about this to yeah, start off. Exactly. I'm laughing about it, but I'm devastated. France is my home. And I thought where at last I will be able to securely live out my days. And I don't see how France will recover from this. I mean, the, the economic destruction, even though people are being subsidized, every time I go outside, another one of the local businesses that I love has gone out of business. And even if they do get the pandemic back under control, it's not going to restore that the local quality because it's going to be big corporations who come back in and and eat it and all up. It. It's devastating. Last night I was tremendously moved because my neighbors staged an opera in the courtyard. It was a beautiful thing to see, but I was also perplexed because they should have been out dropping manure in the Senate. It's something maybe uh, that would make a great article, Claire. <laughs> I think we've we've raised a lot of a lot of questions to which we just don't I think really so. have the answer. Yeah. And historians yeah. are going to be puzzling over this for a very long yeah. time. But I want to I want to finish with that question that Adam Garfinkel asked us. There's no evidence that this was a bioweapon. But now that China and other rivals have seen how shambolic the West's response to a pandemic is, yeah. why wouldn't this be the weapon of choice? Well, that's clearly true. And I'm not even thinking that much about China in this. China is winning the world right now without war. But if you're looking at more nihilistic groups, yes, the virus was not probably uh, invented in the lab in Wuhan. And certainly if it was, it wasn't released on purpose. But no one is really debating the proposition that it could have been created in that lab in Wuhan which is to say a facility about one millionth the cost of the Manhattan Project. So something very much within the means of someone like Osama bin Laden, for example. And so the idea of bioterrorism right now is right up there. This is an ultimate weapon that people can create for tens of millions of dollars, not tens of billions of dollars. Also, I think we're going to have to reform institutions like the FDA, to make sure they are not an obstacle to a timely response. We need something that can act much more nimbly in these circumstances. Right, because it seems like with the mRNA vaccines that we have now, we can actually are in a better shape to respond to a virus threat than we ever were in the past. That's true, and we should pause to appreciate that medicine has been revolutionized by this pandemic. And as with so many wars, a real blessing in medicine has emerged from it. Yeah, I think that's a great place also to finish off, don't you, Claire? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. yeah, something if to think about. Enjoyed this. Please buy me a chateau. <laughs> that's going to be our new, <laughs> our new motto: buy Claire a chateau. There we go. All right, now, so I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here. I'd like to thank everybody for listening in. I know that we've let's say put a lot of questions out there that still need to be answered. And Claire, can you talk a little bit about this Munich Dialogues on Democracy event that you're going to be oh, moderating? Yes. Um, I would love to talk about it, but I am worried that I will mispronounce Bartley's last name. John, perhaps you could help me. Große Richter. Große Richter. Is yes, that right? As in large judge. But Bartley Große Richter, a friend of John's, kindly invited me to moderate a forum she started called the Munich Dialogue on Democracy. She felt about the Trump administration much as I did, and she organized this forum in the same spirit. And their guest on March 25th is going to be Robert Zolik, who is a formidably experienced statesman, former trade delegate for the Bush, first Bush administration, I believe. But he's worked in six administrations, really interesting guy. And he's written a book called America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. And I will be moderating the discussion, and everyone is welcome to join. And I, that, that should be a really good conversation, so please do join. 
Okay, just before we say goodbye, just some admin stuff. If you've got any ideas for an article or a future pod, don't be shy. We're very pleased to receive those. You can write to Claire about that. And please remember that we're also on Apple Podcasts and also Google now, and a whole bunch of other pods for the time being. I'll be hosting it, but we're working on getting something for the Cosmopolicast's own needs. Okay, so on behalf of all of the Cosmopolitan globalists, many warm, warm thanks to you all for listening in. If you think this was interesting or provocative in any way, why don't you tell someone else about it as well? So, on behalf of everyone, goodbye. Ciao for now.